The village of West Glacier, Montana was known as Belton when visitors first started arriving to see the breathtaking scenery of the region. The first influx of adventure seekers arrived thanks to the Great Northern Railway, which brought tracks through the area in the late 1800s. They constructed a station in Belton. The Great Northern is credited for much of the early development here. They began to construct chalets and other accommodations in the area. The railroad promoted Glacier as the Alps of the United States. The railway served as the best way to travel to the otherwise remote region for many years. There were no roads usable by automobiles until 1912, two years after the National Park was officially established. The bridge over the Middle Fork Flathead River did not exist until 1897. Early visitors, after arriving in Belton, were rowed across the river in boats. The original bridge was destroyed in a flood in 1964. It was replaced by the present-day bridge, which is located downstream of the original. This beautiful refuge of nature and wildlife was established as Glacier National Park on May 11, 1910 by President William Howard Taft. The park is located in northwestern Montana and extends northward to the Canadian border. On the north side of the border is the Canadian Waterton National Park. Glacier is over 1 million acres in size and includes two mountain ranges. There are over 130 named lakes. The largest and best known are Lake McDonald and St. Mary Lake. Passing both lakes, traversing the mountain ranges, and crossing the Continental Divide is the famed 50 mile long Going to the Sun Road. What is now the west entrance to Glacier National Park was once a dense forest of towering western red cedars. A dirt road was built in 1895 which connected Belton to the foot of Lake McDonald near the present day Apgar village. The 1897 timber bridge over the Middle Fork Flathead River was located near the Belton train station. Travelers crossing there then followed the riverbank on a dirt road to the park entrance. The park administrative village was built in 1924 and the entrance was improved. A log cabin served as the visitor check station until 1938 when a new bridge was built and the entry was moved. The current entry station was built in 1941 and was designed to cater more to visitors arriving by automobile. It was expanded in 1963, adding a second lane for visitors to speed up the process.
Shakgar village sits at the southwestern shore of Lake McDonald. The first development here were homesteads built by trappers, loggers, and miners. The incredible landscapes in the area became a draw for tourism. The early settlers saw the opportunity and began offering lodging and rental cabins, food, tours, and boating in the area. Two prominent early residents were Charlie Howe and Milo Apgar, for whom the village is named. A fire in 1929 destroyed some of the early buildings, but the village recovered. Today it hosts a waterfront, shops, and the largest campground in the park. itself operated from 1889 to 1970 when it was merged with other railroads to become the Burlington Northern Railroad. Today it is part of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe or BNSF whose trains are a frequent site in the Northwest US. Lake McDonald was formed partially by glaciers changing the landscape. It is the largest lake in the park at nearly 10 miles long, about one mile wide, and nearly 500 feet deep. The Kootenai people's name for the lake is translated as sacred dancing, possibly a reference to ceremonies performed here. It is believed that the present day name of Lake McDonald is in reference to Duncan McDonald, a trader who may have gained immortality by carving his name into a nearby tree in 1878. There were no roads providing access around the lake until about 1912. Early visitors boarded steamboats at the foot of the lake in Apgar to travel the 10 miles or so to accommodations at the eastern side. Going to the Sun Road is approximately 50 miles long and extends from West Glacier in the west to St. Mary in the east, crossing the Continental Divide at Logan Pass. It takes approximately two hours to drive the entire length of the road, which traverses the heart of Glacier National Park. 
road was under construction for nearly 20 years and was dedicated at a ceremony at Logan Pass in 1933, although some construction was yet to be completed after that time. The total cost of the road was about $2.4 million in 1934, which is nearly $46 million in 2019. The road is on the National Register of Historic Places and is the only road currently which is designated both as a National Historic Landmark as well as a National Civil Engineering Landmark. The road begins on the west side in West Glacier, which was known as Belton, Montana, when the road was being constructed. From there, it is a short drive across the Middle Fork Flathead River Bridge and through the wilderness to the entrance to Glacier National Park and then to Apgar Village at the foot of Lake McDonald. From there, the road follows the long and narrow lake to the northeast side at Lake McDonald Lodge. After passing the lake, the road follows the McDonald Creek and into the mountains. Travelers pass through the west side tunnel and around the one and only switchback on the road known as the Loop. From there, the road hugs the side of the steep cliffs of the Garden Wall on its way to Logan Pass. The area between the Loop and Logan Pass offers the most spectacular mountain views. Logan Pass sits along the Continental Divide at a certified elevation of 6,646 feet. A visitor center is located there. The east side of the road descends the pass to ascend to an inspiring St. Mary's Lake. Then. The road follows this lake to its eastern terminus at the town of St. Mary.
Situated along the shores of Lake McDonald, at its northeastern side, is the historic Lake McDonald Lodge. The first lodging here was the Snyder Hotel, built in 1895 by George Snyder, who also ran the steamboats on the lake to ferry passengers to his hotel. Snyder operated the hotel for nine years before selling it. The original building was later relocated and converted into a general store. The present day lodge was built over the winter of 1913 to 1914 as the Glacier Hotel by then owner John Lewis. It was designed to match the architecture of the Swiss style chalets being built in the area by the Great Northern Railway. The construction proved challenging because there was no access by road or rail to the building site at the time. The lodge was constructed with locally sourced materials such as native stone and western red cedar. Other building supplies were carried by boat across the lake in the summer. During the winter of 1913, the lake froze solid, which happens every few years, and supplies were able to be skidded to the northern side across the ice. The side of the lodge is designed to resemble a hunting cabin. The interior is constructed with rusted timber framing, with a large common area overlooked by the balconies of the second level. There are 65 guest rooms in total. The front of the building faces the lake, as the only way to reach it was by boat until 1921, when that section of the road first opened.
Thank you. The Glacier Hotel was sold to the National Park Service in 1930, which was then leased to the Great Northern Railway, which operated it as Lake McDonald Hotel for a few decades. In 1961, the operation was taken over by Glacier Park, Inc., and the name was changed to Lake McDonald Lodge. This is one of the Glacier National Park's famous Red Jammer buses. Red bus drivers were called jammers because of the sound the original buses made with their non-synchronized manual transmissions which required double clutching to downshift. The Red buses were built by White Motor Company and arrived in Glacier in 1914. Buses like these were found in Yellowstone, Yosemite, and other national parks also, but have all since been retired. Glacier is the only park which still operates the buses in an official capacity. The remaining 33 red buses on the Sun Road today were built between 1936 and 1939. By the end of the 20th century, the iconic buses were suffering from advanced age. The remaining buses were believed to be the oldest sightseeing fleet in existence and also the longest servicing, at least in the U.S., operating in Glacier continuously except during World War II due to the fuel rationing. In 1999, the buses were put out of service because of their age and possible safety issues. 
Around that time, Ford Motor Company donated $6 million worth of restoration efforts to repair and refit the aging buses to ensure their continued service. The fleet needed far more than a new coat of paint. The buses underwent a massive restoration and upgrade. The original bodies were retrofitted onto customized modern E450 chassis, revitalizing the vehicles with a modern frame suspension, brakes, and powertrain. The buses now have 5.4 liter V8 engines configured to run on a gasoline propane fuel, which reduces emissions as much as 93%. Post restoration, it is difficult to tell how significantly they have changed from their original form. They retain the original interior design, the individual doors for each row of seats, and the canvas top for the best viewing. You can even still see the accommodation, the front bumpers of the buses, for where the hand crank once was for starting the original engines. If you look in the driver's area of the bus, you will see a modern Ford steering wheel and instrument cluster. But great care was taken to otherwise preserve the historic nature of the vehicles.
This is the entrance to the Trail of the Cedars. This scenic and easy walk is largely over a wooden boardwalk through the old growth forest. It is about half a mile among the western red cedars, western hemlocks, and cottonwoods. Continuing on past the Trail of the Cedars, you can reach the Avalanche Lake Trail. This trail parallels Avalanche Creek for about 2 miles and 500 feet of elevation gain. The trail climbs above the cedar hemlock forest into a forest of spruce and fir at the slightly higher elevation. At the end of the trail is the stunning Avalanche Lake. The lake is surrounded by towering mountains. If it is visited early in the season, those mountains host numerous waterfalls fed by snowmelt and the Sperry Glacier. Later in the season, the waterfalls get smaller and fewer, but some keep flowing all summer long.
the construction of the Going to the Sun Road was a significant accomplishment for those who participated in the process. Surveyors planning the route had to scale dangerous cliffs in the rugged domain of bears and mountain lions. The work to establish where the road would be was started in September 1924. By the time the work was finished in November, the snow was up to their waists. Prospective contractors hoping to bid on the project were climbing frozen slopes so steep that they used safety ropes to prevent losing anyone to the cliffs. Most of the terrain in the higher elevations is rock. Workers had to blast in order to cut the path. The National Park Service oversaw the construction to ensure minimal damage was done to the landscape. To protect the nature, the blast charges were kept small, although the workers snuck in a few larger ones. The blasted material was hauled away by heavy equipment such as steam shovels. In some remote areas, this was even done manually in small carts when equipment could not reach the building site. The National Park Service prohibited the road builders from pushing the debris off the cliffs as it would damage the natural terrain. The material was then sorted so that it could be used in the construction of retaining walls or simply as fill. Many retaining walls were required to stabilize precarious areas of the road or to bench the road out from the cliff face. The walls, as well as guard walls along the road, were constructed of the native stone removed during construction. The use of the native stone helped the road to blend in so well with the nature around it. The road surface was originally made of crushed rock which was graded smooth. The road was continually improved and resurfaced between 1933 and 1950. It wasn't until 1952 that the entire road surface was paved. Building the Going to the Sun Road was backbreaking and dangerous work. Workers earned between 50 cents and $1.15 an hour for their labor. This was a good wage in the 1920s and 30s. With the nation in the Great Depression, it was not difficult for contractors to find people willing to brave the danger and the elements. In all, three men lost their lives during construction. A foreman died in 1926. In 1931, a man was killed by falling rocks. In 1932, a third man fell 400 feet to his death from the road. In addition, a horse named Roney went over the cliff while hauling along the west side and rolled all the way to the creek below along with his cargo of black powder. Originally presumed dead, he was miraculously found alive and well at the bottom of the mountain a while later, suffering only a swollen eye.
The West Tunnel was built in 1926 and is 192 feet long. The original roof of the tunnel was rock. This made the tunnel blend in with the natural landscape better. However, pieces of this rock would occasionally fall onto the roadway below, prompting the roof to be redone in concrete for safety. One unique feature of this tunnel is the pedestrian walkway, which provides access to three cutouts in the tunnel wall, allowing great viewing spots of the surrounding peaks. In addition to this and the East Tunnel, the Going to the Sun Road originally had multiple half tunnels, which were areas where rock outcroppings would extend partially over the road. Unfortunately, just like the West Tunnel roof, the rock proved to be too unstable and pieces would occasionally fall onto the road surface. By the 1950s, all of them, save for one, had collapsed naturally or been removed for safety. The only remaining half tunnel is near what is known as Crystal Point. The only switchback on the road is known as the loop. It is a 75-foot radius turn which changes the road's direction from heading northwest to the east, which brings the road along the natural mountainside formation known as the Garden Wall. The loop also contains parking areas to stop and enjoy the view of Heaven's Peak and Packer's Roost. The design of going to the Sun Road featuring only a single switchback is considered a significant engineering feat. The first proposed design was offered by National Park Service Chief Engineer George Goodwin. This plan climbed Logan Pass through a series of 15 switchbacks. It was considered easier to construct and would represent a statement of human mastery over nature. With this design, visitors could look down the face of the pass and see most of the road predominantly displayed along the rock wall, humanity conquering the cliffs. However, not everyone agreed that this would be the best approach for the park. An alternative route was proposed by National Park Service landscape architect Thomas Vint. His proposal included only a single long switchback with the road hanging along the garden wall. It required more stone masonry retaining walls and would be more difficult to build. This road, however, would blend into the mountainside rather than conquering it. It would also offer the sweeping vistas of the mountain range. National Park Director Stephen T. Mather enlisted U.S. Bureau of Public Roads Engineer Frank Kittredge to conduct a feasibility study of the two routes. He found the wide curves, the lower 6% grade, and the aesthetic appeal of the Vint proposal more desirable. Even though it was more expensive to build, Mather selected the Vint proposal as this design had fewer impacts on nature and would truly make the interior of the park more accessible to the public. Part of the appeal of driving the Sun Road today is to step back in time and experience the same stone masonry features, original alignment, and the historic look and feel of the road as it was in 1932.
Birdwoman Falls is a waterfall seen across the valley between Mount Oberlin and Mount Cannon. The falls is 492 feet tall. It is fed by melting snow and glaciers. Notice the U-shape of the valleys below. This is indicative of landscaping formed by glaciers. The other major source of valleys and canyons in the world is erosion by flowing rivers. This produces more of a V-shaped valley. When you see this U-shape, you know it was carved by glacial ice and not by a river.
The Weeping Wall gets its name from the waters cascading over the rocks onto the road. The falls are fed by snowmelt and start off at the beginning of the season as a torrent that soaks passing vehicles. By the end of the season, such as now, the fall is much more gradual. The road engineers had to install a special drainage system here to be able to move early season water off the road. This roughly 135 degree curve is known as the Big Bend and offers some of the best views of the western side of the Continental Divide. Mount Cannon, Mount Oberlin, Heaven's Peak, and the Weeping Wall are all visible from here. This area is also one of the most quintessential sections of the Garden Wall, which is how this entire mountain face is referred. It gets its name from the colorful plant life that grows here in the summer months, including bear grass and huckleberry bushes. Huckleberries are very popular with the bear population of Glacier. They are also a great treat for human visitors. When visiting Glacier, be sure to try out some huckleberry ice cream or a huckleberry milkshake. There are about eight miles of these stone guard walls along the length of the Going to the Sun Road. The walls are about 18 inches high and 18 inches thick. The crenellations are spaced every 9 to 12 feet and are about 6 inches tall. The guardrails were constructed from the native stone taken from the cliffs as the road's course was cut. Styles called Type 2 and Type 2A were used during the 20s and 30s respectively. They were very similar in appearance, differing only by the types of joining lines among the pieces of stone. The guard walls are frequently repaired and replaced as a result of damage by avalanches and the harshness of winter. Today, most of the walls are a cavity fill type, made of reinforced concrete, which is stronger than the original structures. Even these new walls are clad with native stone material, so they are aesthetically indistinguishable from the originals. This bridge is known as the Triple Arches. It is one of the most famous and recognizable landmarks on the road. The original plan for this gap in the mountainside was to construct a massive retaining wall. However, engineers devised an alternative plan which became this iconic bridge. The bridge's spans are 16 feet across with five foot radius arches. On this September day, the road will be more accurately named Going to the Clouds Road. In a few moments, we will drive into the cloud ceiling, 
Unfortunately, Logan Pass was completely fogged in today. We will drive back below the clouds on the eastern side on our way to St. Mary. This is Oberlin Bend, a sharp curve just before Logan Pass. This area is ideal habitat for Glacier's population of mountain goats. They can often be seen here. Welcome to the Continental Divide at Logan Pass. At an elevation of 6,646 feet, this is the point which divides the flow of waters in the western part of the United States. Water to the west of this point flows to the Pacific Ocean, and water to the east flows toward the Mississippi River. Logan Pass was named in honor of Major William Logan, the first superintendent of Glacier Park. The pass was officially opened on June 15, 1929, following the completion of the west side of Going to the Sun Road in October 1928. At that time, all that was offered here was a rest stop in a parking lot with an opportunity to hike some of the many scenic trails around the pass. The Logan Pass Visitor Center was constructed from 1963 to 1966. It was part of what was called the Mission 66 Park Facilities Improvement Program. Like the road that brings visitors here, 
The visitor center was constructed of stone native to the area. It also features exposed timber framing construction inside. The primary architect on the project was Cecil Doty. The visitor center itself is also on the National Register of Historic Places. Lunch Creek flows down a natural rock formation from Pollock Mountain. Its name came from this location being a popular place for park visitors to stop for lunch as they traveled the road. an ice forming on the roadway below, creating a hazard to visitors.
this section of the road, around mile 34, is known as the Big Drift. Weather patterns in winter allow snow to accumulate here in dramatic proportions. It is not uncommon for up to 80 feet of snow to be on this part of the road, and it can take weeks to completely clear it to allow the road to open each summer. The Sai Bend is a large curve sitting below Sai Mountain and crossing Sai Creek. The bend is between going to the Sun Mountain and Pekin Mountain and was a challenging portion of the road to construct. The road turns more than 180 degrees here and crosses a 10 foot by 10 foot culvert to accommodate the creek.
Jackson Glacier is the easiest glacier to see in the park. It is one of the 25 officially designated glaciers in Glacier National Park. Located on Mount Jackson, the glacier was about 250 acres in area when last measured in 2005. All visitors to any national park owe much to the dedication of the park rangers who keep both the park, its wildlife, and its visitors safe. Park rangers are law enforcement officers, emergency medical first responders, search and rescue experts, as well as firefighters. Quote, 
Stephen T. Mather, the first director of the National Park Service. If a trail is to be blazed, it is send a ranger. If an animal is floundering in the snow, a ranger is sent to pull him out. If a bear is in the hotel, if a fire threatens a forest, if someone needs to be saved, it is send a ranger. If a dude wants to know the why, if a sagebrusher is puzzled about a road, it is ask the ranger. Everything the ranger knows, he will tell you, except about himself.
Mayor's Check Station on the east side of the park was built in 1918. It was actually a tent. An actual checking station was built when the road was rerouted in 1930. That station was about half a mile south of where the visitor center stands today. The current entrance was constructed in 1942 and was designed with the same styling as the West Interest building built a year earlier.